by Debbie Harit from Georgia Tech, who's uh, taking some time at Facebook right now. But um, she's going to be talking to us about connecting vision and language through interaction. Right. Thanks. Um, thanks, Andrea. Thanks for having me. Um, and so I'm going to I'm going to talk about uh, learning by playing within this space of connecting um, vision, language, and some common sense reasoning. Um, and so my my background is in computer vision. And so in sort of semantic image understanding, we've traditionally been interested in problems where you take an image like this and you try and figure out uh, where all the objects are. Is this a, uh, what the scene type is? Is this a college campus? Is it a beach? Is it an office? Um, is it taken indoors? Is it taken outdoors? Where are the people? What are they doing? How are they interacting with each other? And so on, right? Um, but more recently, um, a sort of a, com a, a small set of uh, researchers in this space have gotten interested in trying to not just understand the image, but also translate this understanding of the image to words um, and communicate it to a human in a natural way, right? So be it things like describing this image in a sentence, or maybe telling a short story about this image, or maybe answering a question about this image. Um, and someday, maybe even having a natural language dialogue um, with an agent that's grounded in this visual content. Right? Um, and so the space of understanding images, mapping this understanding to natural language, and communicating this in a way that is very natural and human-like, um, I think this intersection is becoming more and more interesting. Right? And so we've made, as a community, a lot of progress in connecting um, two of those circles, connecting images to language. Right? So we can now. We now have algorithms that can automatically take an image like this and describe it in a sentence like man in blue wetsuit is surfing on wave, or take an image like this and see a group of young people playing a game of frisbee, or for this image, seeing a car is parked in the middle of nowhere, um, or a pot of broccoli on a stove. Right? So we've become quite good at sort of recognizing the obvious things that we see in an image, stitching it together to form a natural sounding um, sentence and conveying that back. Right? Um, but if you think about what it would take to describe an image like this, right? If I, if I ask you to describe it, some of you might describe it as a man is rescued from his truck that is hanging dangerously from a bridge, right? So I think machines today would be okay with sort of spitting out man, bridge, hanging, truck, and so on. But if you think about what it takes to say words like rescued and dangerous, you realize that the system needs a sense of what must have happened just before this image was taken, what is likely to happen a few seconds after this, what intentions of people in this scene probably are, and so on, to be able to say words like rescued and dangerous. Right? And so you sort of need this common sense reasoning, if you will, a common sense understanding of the world and how it functions to be able to produce outputs like this. Right? Um, and so one question that people have looked at is, so, well, so how do we, where do we gather this common sense knowledge from? Right? Um, and one good response has been that we can use all the text that's around us on the web, for instance, every book that's been written up, and try to take advantage of that to learn this common sense knowledge about how the world works. And that makes sense in a lot of cases, but one issue with text is that it is known to suffer from reporting bias. Right? So text is written by humans to communicate with other humans. We don't like talking to each other about boring, mundane, common sense stuff. We like talking to each other about things that are unusual and interesting, and as a result, it lends itself to be particularly bad in some situations to learn exactly this common mundane knowledge about how the world works. It's more yeah. likely that man bites a dog than a dog bites a man. Exactly. It's more likely that man bites a dog than dog bites a man. It's less likely than man. Exactly. In text, it is more likely that man bites a dog than dog bites a man, but that's not um, what you want to learn. And in fact, those are exactly the kinds of examples that I wanted to show also, that if you look at how often these different phenomena are mentioned with respect to people in text, and if you try to use that frequency as a proxy for how often this happens in the world, you would end up concluding that people inhale six times um, as often as they exhale. Um, and, and maybe what's worse is that people get murdered 17 times as often um, as they exhale, right? But, um, here's, here's another one. Um, again, these are different body parts that are mentioned with respect to people. Um, and if you use this as a proxy for how often people have those body parts, you would conclude that people have heads 1,100 times as often as they have gallbladders. That's not the case. It's just that we don't like talking about gallbladders too much, right? And so it doesn't, it doesn't show up in text. Um, and so that, that's an issue. And so sort of coming from a computer vision background, um, the thought was, well, instead of trying to rely on text that was explicitly written by humans to communicate with other humans, is there a way to just sort of watch the world around us, right? Just use the visual data that tells us what's going on in the world 
um, and leverage that structure to learn this common sense knowledge, right? And there is a lot of structure in the visual world, right? So if I show you this image and I ask you to describe it, you might say these are two professors conversing in front of a blackboard, right? But if I now change just one subtle thing about this image, your description will change, right? You might say that these are two professors standing in front of a blackboard, right? And so the signal that gaze of two people relative to each other differentiates whether two people are talking to each other versus just standing around is rich structure that we could learn from the visual world. Um, but that's hard to do, right? It would be hard to do this for a few different reasons. Uh, one is we typically lack this visual density. It's hard for me to find two real images that differ from each other just in terms of, for example, gaze of two people, but where the resultant semantic meaning changes, right? Where, where do I find data like that, right? Um, even if I had that data, detecting basic things like I would need sort of everything annotated in this image. For example, something as minute as the gaze of these two people, only then would I be able to learn what that means in terms of the semantics. Right? And so then your response might be, well, you're a computer vision researcher. Why do you need annotations? You should just go ahead and detect everything. Right? But it turns out that even with all the progress deep learning has made, um, we can't detect every single thing, every single semantic feature in an image to be able to learn this rich connection. Right? Um, and so this sort of puts us in a bit of a chicken and egg problem, right? On one hand, I'm saying I want to learn common sense so that I can do a better job of understanding the image and communicating it to a human. Um, but here I am saying that in order to learn this common sense, I first need to solve computer vision so that I can extract all the semantic features that I care about um, and learn this mapping. Um, and so then the question was, well, how do we try and break out of the cycle, right? And so the way we thought of doing that um, was by questioning whether you even need photorealism in the first place if what you're interested in doing is learning semantic common sense about the world, right? And the claim, but what I'm claiming is that the answer is no, that if what I'm trying to learn uh, is common sense knowledge, then that knowledge doesn't lie in the low level RGB values of the pixels, it lies in the semantics of the scene. And so all I, all I care about is a semantically rich um, scene, a semantically rich visual world, even if it's not photorealistic, right? And so with that thought, um, we introduced these two characters, Mike and Jenny, um, and they had their own world with sort of a variety of toys and food items and indoor objects, outdoor objects, animals. Uh, Mike and Jenny can have different expressions, different poses. Um, and sort of with this fairly uh, simple interface and fairly simple world, we can get people to interactively create um, visual data for us, right? Semantically rich scenes where they can move objects around, they can flip them left to right, they can have a few different scales. And just with a few um, interactions, you have a fairly rich scene where if I asked you to sit down and write sort of a short paragraph describing what's going on, it wouldn't feel very unnatural to you, right? You would be able to tell us what's going on here. All right, and so what I'll do now is um, I'll give you several examples of how we've taken advantage of this interaction modality where people can create the visual data for us to learn from um, for, a, for, for several different tasks. All right. All right, so one of the first things we did um, was the following. Uh, we took a sentence like Mike fights off a bear by giving him a hot dog while Jenny runs away. And we asked several different people to depict this sentence to us in this, in this interface that I showed you. Right? And the interesting thing is, if I ask each one of you to create the scene, you will all create scenes that do have that meaning, but have different objects present in them. There may or may not be trees. The trees may or may not have fruits. Where exactly Mike and Jenny are will be different. Um, clouds, sun, all of that sort of will vary. But what's consistent in all of them is that Mike is facing the bear, he's holding a hot dog, and Jenny's running off in the opposite direction. Right? And so this is something that you can learn from this setup, right? It would be hard for you to find 10 real images that all have the same meaning so that I can sit down and figure out what is it about these images that contributed to that meaning, right? But here, because you are active, interactively collecting data from users, I can sample 10, 50, 100, whatever Mechanical Turk allows me to do, different samples of visual interpretations of this exact same sentence, right? Um, and so we, we collected a data set like that. We took these 1,000 different semantic classes. And by semantic classes, I mean these 1,000 different sentences. And we had 10 people on Mechanical Turk create a scene um, for each one of those. Um, and then there's sort of fun things you can do, right? And one thing to remember, by the way, is that this scene is sort of trivially fully annotated, right? It's a, it's an, it's a synthetic image that, has, that we have created. So we know exactly where everything is. We know all the expressions, all the poses, and everything of all the objects that are present here, right? Um, and so you can start asking fun questions like, 
which visual features are important for the semantic meaning, um, or which words correlate to specific visual features. And so you can basically learn a mapping between the visual features and semantic meaning or language um, through, through this data. Right? And the, the interesting thing here is that you had full control over the density of the distribution that you're learning from. If I wanted a very heavy sampling of the same concept, in this case, literally the exact same semantic being replicated multiple times in the visual scene, you can do that with this. Right? Um, and so here's one illustration of what we can do as a result of this mapping. We can now take, um, as input, a short description, like Jenny is catching the ball, Mike is kicking the ball, the table is next to the tree, um, and we can sort of uh, parse this um, with some basic NLP techniques, and then using this automatically generate sort of a scene from scratch that depicts these sentences, right? So we can take as input a sentence or a description and output a scene in this virtual world that would correspond to this meaning. There is no tree, that's a good point. Um, so the original scene had a tree and the tree got dropped in the NLP processing that we were using at the time. This is from 2013, so it's from a few years ago. Um, but that processing dropped the tree and so we didn't end up creating a tree. Another interesting thing is it just says ball. It doesn't specify what kind of a ball. Ground truth happened to have an American football. Um, and what we ended up creating was a European, Indian, no, <laughs> the other football. Right, or a soccer ball, if you will. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dependent on, on the agents that are doing your, your uh, mechanical Turk, uh, the crowdsourcing. So do you try to, to model it, to control it in some way? I mean, uh, no, we, we just treat them all as a crowd, or just as one sort of average human. Um, and so we're not reasoning about the fact that if the, if the Turker was European and if, if it said football, then they would use this versus if they were American and it said football, it would use this. We don't model for that. In this case, it's not even specified. It's underspecified. So it could end up sampling um, either one, even if we were modeling that, unless we gave the agent a personality like being European or American. Yeah. Yes? When you say automatically generated, it's generated from the free part like parts. Or, right, or so it, it, assumes the, it assumes access to the library of clip art, so it's not generating the appearance of Jenny or the appearance of Mike. It is generating, it is deciding what pose to give Jenny and what expression to okay. give Jenny. So it's picking the variables from within uh, the clip art library, yeah. Yes. Is it a sentence that was in the training set or is it a, 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 no, a totally? The, Sentence. It's a fresh sentence. Yeah. Um, the vocabulary, I'm sure, overlaps because things like Jenny and ball and catching, kicking, table, next to tree, all of those are common enough concepts, but I'm sure those concepts in isolation occurred in the training set. But this construction is a, is a test sentence that wasn't seen before. Yes. <coughs> yeah. What about generalizing beyond the, the, the specific object you have in your game? Like, if instead of Jenny, I will say, Anna, will, will anything be generated at um, So if, you, if you're literally talking about Jenny versus Anna, then no, because we had told Turkers that this person is called Jenny and this person is called Mike. Um, and actually, Mike and Jenny are quite popular on Mechanical Turk. If any of you do crowdsourcing, you're welcome to sort of browse through the forums. They all still talk about them. Um, but no, so we don't know. To us, Jenny is the only way of referring to this clip art number 17. Um, if you're talking about synonyms in general that um, instead of kicking if it was something like throwing, which is similar. The only way we would know that those two might have similar positions of the object with respect to the subject is if we've seen that during training. So if we have seen people talk about kicking and we've seen people talk about throwing and we realize that the objects end up being placed similarly, um, we would learn that. So this was all, so this was early. In, so now if we were to do this, we would probably use things like embeddings of words which would already convey some semantics learned from text. And so we would already know a priori that maybe throwing and kicking have relations. Um, but this work doesn't, ha doesn't know that. Yes? I noticed that the automatically generated one includes a cloud and the sun, but it's not explicitly stated in the sentence. Is there a way to control for whether or not the system thinks that the cloud and sun correlates to Mike and Jenny specifically, or it's like overgeneralizing or undergeneralizing? Right, so what it's doing is it's, it's based on the sentence. It's updating um, potentials of how likely each object is to be there. And there's also a prior on that. So the system has a sense for a priori, what are the chances that there is a sun? What are the chances that there is a cloud? And so unless there's something stated in the sentence that decreases the, so for example, if it said, and it's raining, 
then the model from the training data would have known that if it rains, there typically isn't a sun. And so the word raining would reduce the probability of the sun being there relative to the prior. Um, but there's nothing in this sentence that discourages the cloud in the sun. So just from an a prior probability, it's sampling. So sometimes you'll get a cloud, sometimes you won't get a cloud if it's not relevant, if it doesn't mess with the semantics, basically. So if you just keep asking for, for pictures that don't mention the weather, will it, could it like be biased toward a cloud, uh, partly cloudy day or? Yeah, if the training data was biased towards a partly cloudy day, it's, it's, yeah, it's going to sample from that, so that, that would happen. You would have control over that if you wanted it to not listen to the prior too much, you would be able to turn that down and just focus on what's right. explicitly said. Right. Specifically related to the input, then it could be random, right? Right, and, and it is, yeah. Right. So, some, um, so, so it would be interesting to look at 10 different samplings of the scenes for the same uh, description, and I'm sure the sun will be in and out and the clouds will be in and out. Yes. So like any process where you train something with synthetic data, what you're learning is the process of generating the synthetic data. And I thought that you started by saying you were interested in learning how to actually interpret images, and you're actually you're learning the process of generating images. Right. So um, I agree that whatever we've learned is how to generate images in Mike and Jenny's world. Um, and I, towards the end of the talk, I will show you how we use this to generalize to something real. But I want to point out that I'm not, I wasn't saying that I want to um, generate realistic images, right? My goal is not to be able to learn a model that can generate realistic images. My goal is to learn common sense knowledge that would then generalize to realistic scenarios where I can take advantage of that common sense knowledge, right? So the common sense knowledge that I want to learn. Mm -hmm. That common sense knowledge is being provided by the I will eventually, I haven't talked exactly about how this relates to common sense, I will get there. But the idea would be to see if we can use this abstract world to learn common sense that does generalize to the real world. Need not be real images. And, and it'll become clear as I, go, as, I, as I get towards the end of the talk. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. All right, so here's um, one other example of something we did um, to show you this sort of interesting things you can do because you get to control the density of the data. So in this case, instead of trying to learn um, something in sort of just the gen generic semantics of kids playing in a park like it was in the previous case, here we're only interested in seeing, in learning what it looks like for two people to be interacting with each other. And so what we did was we gave Mechanical Turk workers this interface. Here you can see that the poses are soft. You can pick a couple of different genders, um, a few different colors of hair, and so on. And we're asking them to show us what it looks like for a person dancing with another person. So far it looks like a person is hitting another person, but then as soon as they change the expression, the meaning of the scene changed, right? Um, and so what we can do is sort of repeat that process again, right? I can tell them, I can ask 50 different people to show me what it looks like for person A to be dancing with person B, walking with person B, holding hands with person B, arguing with person B, talking to person B, and so on. Right? Um, and so here's, um, just to give you a sense, yes? You keep track of the entire process of assembling, not just the final product. Right. We do keep track of that. We haven't done anything to make use of that so far, but we do keep track of all intermediate stages that lead to that. Yes. Um, and so just to give you a sense for um, the kinds of things Mechanical Turk workers will create um, for these different concepts, um, here are some examples of jumping over, holding hands with, dancing with. Um, and I, I find that people often, so every so often I'll hear a talk where they say, oh, these are Mechanical Turk workers. Obviously, they did, they did not do a great job. And I feel the need to sort of push back on that, that in our experience, they do Right, like if you look at all the different poses that they've created of people dancing with each other and the amount of detail that they put in, um, at least I was uh, pleasantly, it was, it was quite nice for us to see that. Um, and then once we had this sort of taking a step towards seeing if it can generalize to, real, to the real world, um, we wanted to see if we can use this as training data and then use uh, real images of people interacting with each other um, to then recognize what the interaction is. Right? And so this scenario would be that during training, the system has not seen any real example. Right? So in that sense, it's sort of zero shot. All it has seen is someone depicting um, interactively to the agent what this interaction looks like through just the simple clip art interface. Right? And we're not generalizing from pixels to pixels. Right? You wouldn't expect that to happen. But what we're generalizing is from pose and expressions to uh, poses and expressions detected in these real images. Um, and what we find is you can do above charts. 
right? So it gives you statistically significantly above chance performance. It's not sort of the performance that you get. You would get the same performance if you had just two or three examples of real images. Um, and right, so if you train on just two or three real examples and then test on real images, that performance is about the same as training on 50 of these synthetic examples to then gen to generalize to real images. So it's not enough of a ratio for, for me to advocate that this is how you should be learning how to interact with people. I think right now it's still easier um, to just try and get images from the web and learn from that. But it was still an interesting conceptual experiment to see if, to what extent this generalizes. So yes? Does that involve a, a stage of, of extracting features like pose or, or facial expressions yes. from the image that is not dependent on this process? Is yes. That, yes. So we, right. so we took an off the shelf. Exactly. So we do compare to what was a state of the art pose detector at the time. Um, and if we use that as a feature extractor, what accuracy would you get versus if we assume ground truth pose? So we assume that whoever is working on going from pixels to semantics has done their job well, then to what extent would the semantics from here transfer here? And there's also other um, sort of feature level issues in the sense that this is just a 2D canvas. Right? There's no um, out of plane rotation or sort of coming closer to the camera or anything like that. And these real images have all of that. So none of that is generalizing. So if you really wanted to push on using this as an interface to train for um, recognizing interactions between people, one thing that would help a lot is have this interface be a little bit more complicated. If it was an actual 3D interface where people can move people around in 3D, um, then I think that would get you much better. So when the, uh, the Turkers give you uh, the example of something like dance ways, do you get one instance from them, or do you get a sequence of instances? We get multiple people to detect, depict that to us. So we asked 50 different workers so to for create. A worker. For a single worker, they would give us just one Picture. illustration for each concept. So if we, I think we had about 60 different concepts in this data set. So that worker is free to give us anywhere from one to 60, depending on how many will, hits they're willing I to do. Like if you give, give if them give you one typical, they would create one, the, the same thing. Like, yeah, <coughs> right. So we actually do we we encourage diversity um, in certain ways. So for example, in this case, we initialize the poses of the people somewhat randomly, in hopes that assuming workers want to do as less work as necessary, they'll sort of converge to some local minimum of whichever um, is a dancing pose relative to that initialization. And same thing with Mike and Jenny. We gave them access to a subset of the clip art which was randomly sampled. So sometimes they would see a sun, sometimes they wouldn't see a sun, and that would encourage them to create different scenes. Yeah. All right. Um, so a third um, setup within which we explored the use of, again, having control over the density of data that you get was for this problem of visual question answering. Um, and so the task is given an image and a free form question about this image, we want to train agents that can answer this question. Right? And there's been a lot of work in this space in the past few years. Um, you see questions like what color are our eyes, when you need to detect small objects and recognize the color, um, how many slices of pizza are there, so you need to count. Um, is this a vegetarian pizza? So you might need access to some external knowledge base that tells you that the presence of meat uh, might imply not vegetarian and so on, right? So this is just to give you a sense for what the problem statement is. Given any image, any question, we want to train a system that can answer it. Um, and we've made a lot of progress in the sense that now, so state of the art about a year and a half ago was at about 55, 56%. Today it's at 68% and human accuracy, interhuman agreement is at about 83%. So just to give you a sense, right? So it's been very exciting. You can now, there are online demos where you can upload an image, ask a question, and you get an answer back, and it makes sense a lot of times. Um, but one issue that happens in, these, um, in a lot of these VQA, visual question answering settings is that there is a heavy language bias, right? And what I mean by that is the following, that for a lot of these data sets, if you ask the question, is there a clock? And if you just say yes, you'll be right 98% of the time, right? Um, if, uh, is the man wearing glasses? You just say yes, you'll be right 94% of the time. Are the lights on? Yes, you'll be right 85% of the time. Do you see a? Don't even listen to the rest of the question. Don't even look at the image. Just say yes, and you'll be right 87% of the time, right? And now I'm sure you guys are wondering that why would that be the case, right? How can the lights be on 90 or 85% of the time, right? And the reason that happens in these data sets, right? It doesn't happen in the real world. The reason it happens in these data sets is that people were, when you're collecting the data set, people were asking questions while looking at the image. So you think of asking about a clock tower only when you actually see a clock tower in the image, 
right? So at, at test time and also during training, you see is there a clock tower in this image only for images that actually have a clock tower. And so your model just learns to say yes, and it will give you good accuracies, and everything just kind of works out, right? Um, and, and, and so that's an issue, right? And so that was hindering progress on sort of these binary questions in particular where there is a heavy bias towards saying yes. And it's actually not just a bias towards saying yes. In some cases, there's a bias towards no. So if the question starts with, should this person be doing blah, the answer is usually no, because you think about asking that only in images where someone is doing something they shouldn't be doing. That's not a good idea, right? So it's actually not just about yes versus no. It's just that the framing of the question gives away information about whether the likely answer is going to be yes or no. And that's problematic, especially coming from a computer vision standpoint. If you're trying to use visual question answering as a benchmark to measure how well these computer vision algorithms are actually understanding the image, right? So the language bias can be quite annoying from that perspective. Um, and so we wanted to try and see if we can rectify this, right? And we have this tool that lets you control the density of visual data that you look at. And so what we did, the, the, one of the VQA data sets that's, um, that, that we've created has these questions on these clip art images. And so on this image, the original question was, is there a place to sit other than the floor? And the answer was no. And so what we did is we asked people, we showed them this image, and we asked them to modify the scene as little as necessary so that the answer becomes yes. Right? So we want them to modify the scene so that the answer to the question, is there a place to sit other than the floor, becomes yes. And so in this case, the person chooses to bring in a couch, because once there is a couch, there is a place other than the floor that someone can sit on. Right? And we can do this for every single question, for every single binary question, for every image in the data set. And so what that gives us is this nice setup where you now have two complementary scenes that are globally very similar, but they have some subtle difference in them, as a result of which the answer to a question is yes for one and no for the other. Right? So in this case, is the girl walking the bike? Is yes here and no here? Holistically, the images are very similar, but there's a subtle difference in the interaction between the bike and the girl that changes the answer. Right? And so now the language only prior can get you nothing. It's just chance performance. Right? The answer could be yes or no. And you really have to look at the image, and not just the image, the relevant portion of the image, to be able to figure out what the right answer is. Right? And so this, again, is a result of us having access to the density of data on which we not just train, but also test. Right? Um, so just to give you a sense for this, if your task was, if we make the task really hard, where you're given two images, you're given these complementary scenes, and only if your model manages to, manages to answer the question correctly for both those images do you get a point. If you get even one of them wrong, you get zero points. Right? So in that setup, if you look at sort of the original unbalanced situation where there was a heavy bias, if you just answered questions based on the question alone, you now have zero accuracy. Because based on the question alone, you're always going to predict the same answer. And so you will always get one of these two images wrong. Right? So you get zero accuracy. If you add in the holistic image features, it made some difference, but it couldn't help much, right? And that was, that, that was what I was saying earlier, that the image didn't have much of a role to play if you're training on just the unbalanced data, right? But on this balance set, question alone, again, can't buy you anything. But now the image really matters. If you train your models on this balance set that has these two complementary scenes, and so your model has learned to be able to tell the difference of what makes the answer yes versus no, the image features actually make a bigger difference, right? Does this make sense? Um, and then if you make the model a little bit more sophisticated, where instead of just looking at the whole image, based on the question, it parses it to figure out what the primary object is, what the secondary object is, and what the relation is, and then explicitly aligns these to figure out, here's the girl, here's the bike, and then decides if the interaction is walking or not. Right? So this is a more detailed computer vision algorithm that's backing this VQA system. Um, what we find is that this attention-based model, so the model that decides where to look and then answer the question, can give you more improvements, right? So in the unbalanced case, it gives you some improvement. It's not too exciting. But in the balanced case, where the model has been trained on the balanced data, so it can actually learn the visual concepts, you see a bigger improvement in performance. Yeah, yes? This attention base is, is really kind of geared towards very specific questions. Because if my question was, is the picture realistic? So you don't know where to, to, to direct your attention. Right. Or, or is it a, you know, a beautiful picture? Or is it ugly? Right. Right, and so in in this case, um, even the tuple. So the tuple has this primary object, secondary object, and relation setup. So and it is allowed to have the latter two fields be blank. So in this case, it would end up probably is the picture beautiful would just end up being um, picture picture blank beautiful or picture beautiful blank. I'll have to think exactly where that thing would end up. 
So that is fine. The tuple representation would generalize OK. And now the alignment model is also automatically learned. So the model could learn that the alignment of the word picture or image or, or photo is to the entire frame and not to some individual object. Right? So the attention model is learned. It's not something that's hand-coded to say that bike means this object and girl means this object. It's learning that on its own from training data. So if it has seen enough examples where someone refers to just the image or just the photo during training, it could learn an alignment, essentially a, a, an attention map that is very uniform. So it, has, it, 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 it decides how much to focus, how sharp that attention map should be um, based on the question. Right. So, so conceptually, it should work out. In practice, I don't think we've seen too many examples of questions like that. So chances are it won't be able to deal with it very well. But I think the model allows for that. All right, so just to kind of quickly recap a little bit what I've said so far. Um, so sort of in these abstract scenes, um, the idea is you're trying to get the machine to learn as humans are playing around in different virtual worlds. Um, and what's nice about the setup is one, it gives you fully annotated visual data. So you can extract whatever semantic information you want. Um, and what's nice is that it, this setup of collecting data through these interfaces let, gives you full access to, um, sort of gives you full control over the distribution of the data that you get. Right? And this is useful when you're trying to use that as training data so that you can, do, you can see subtle differences and learn what those differences mean in terms of semantics. But it's also nice that it gives you that same control also for test data. So if I want to be using um, sort of visual question answering, for example, as a benchmark to evaluate progress on computer vision tasks, I can create a test set that is as balanced as I want it to be so that that measurement is correlated to progress in computer vision to the extent that I would like it to be. Right? You're, not to the, you're not at the mercy of Flickr and Google and those data distributions, um, and then you just have to deal with it. Right Here you have full access to it. So I think that's a nice um, complementary thing that you get from this setup. Right? So to learn from and to evaluate on. All right, so are there any, any questions? All right. Um, how much time, more time do I have? I have Another five minutes at least. All right. Um, so let me try and connect this back to the common sense um, things that I was saying earlier. And um, what I'm going to look at are tasks that are purely text-based. So at test time, the input is a piece of text. And you need to make some assessment. The machine needs to make some assessment that will require common sense reasoning. Right? And so the key idea is going to be that when you see this text at test time, I'm going to argue that, don't, that the machine should not just reason about that text and make the assessment that it needs to, but it should also imagine the scene behind the text and use that in making that assessment. Right? Um, so let me, let me give you an example of this. So for example, the, te the purely text-based task could be given a tuple. The machine's job is to assess how likely it is. Right? So let's say on a scale from 0 to 1, how likely is it for a man to be holding a meal? Right? Seems, seems likely enough as opposed to, for example, a tree growing in a table. Right? So we want a machine to realize that this is more likely than this. Um, another example could be fill in the blank. So Mike is having lunch when he sees a bear, and then what happens? Right? Is it A, Mike orders a pizza, B, Mike hugs the bear, C, bears are mammals, D, Mike tries to hide. Right? I think most of us would think that the more likely response is D, Mike tries to hide. Right? Um, or this third, the last example is um, a visual paraphrasing task, where you're given two descriptions, and the machine's job is to figure out if both of these descriptions could be describing the same scenario, the same scene, or not. Right? So Jenny was going to throw her pie at Mike. Jenny is very angry. Jenny is holding a pie. Right? Um, we might go through reasoning that says when someone is angry, they might throw things, and in order to throw something, you have to be holding it. And so these two could be describing the same scene. Right? Um, and so my argument is that when you're given a task like this, let's say this visual paraphrasing, instead of going through this explicit reasoning that when you're angry, you throw things, and to throw something, you have to hold it, and hoping to learn all of this from text, instead, if you just imagine the scene, if you just imagine someone throwing something, you will imagine them holding it. Right? And so if you imagine the scene be underlying this text and reason about similarities in that scene space, in addition to reasoning about similarity in the text space, you might be able to, better, to do better than if you just reasoned about the text. Right? Same thing with this previous example of if you, if you think about what it looks like for a man to be holding a meal and reason about how often have I seen this before, instead of just thinking about how often have I read about men holding meals, you might do better 
if you reason about that vision also in addition to the text, right? Um, and so that's what we'll go ahead and do. So if, if your task is this fill in the blank, what we'll do is we'll plug in each option into this question. So this gives me a full, full description. I've already told you that we have a way of generating a scene given an input description, right? And so I can go ahead and loop through all four options, plug them in, generate scenes for all four of these. Again, as a reminder, what's relevant in the scenes is not the RGB values, it's not the pixels, right? What's relevant are the semantics. Right? And so we're going to be imagining these scenes in, in this virtual world um, of the same Mike and Jenny world that I told you. Um, and so we can loop through, let's quickly go through that. And so for each one of these descriptions, we can generate a scene that corresponds to it. And then the model that we set up says that the text with the correct option plugged in and the corresponding scene, all of this together should score higher than if you had plugged in the incorrect option and the image scene that would result from it. Right? And so we just train a rank SVM that extracts features from both the scene and the text instead of just the text. Right? Um, and so what we find is this helps. So these are accuracies on fill in the blanks and visual paraphrasing. Higher is better. Um, this is chance performance. This is what you would do with text alone. So this is sort of our strong baseline that we're comparing against. This is what you do with vision alone if you completely ignore the text. Um, and then if you combine the two, you see an improvement in performance, uh, more so on the fill in the blank side. Um, this is for the tuple case where man holds mean versus tree grows in table. Again, higher is better, text alone, vision alone, and text plus vision. Right? So vision gives you um, some improvement over the text. Um, one more thing that we've done sort of to follow up on this is that do we actually need to explicitly create the scene to then reason about it? Or can the information of the scene already be part of the embeddings that are describing the text? Right? Because you're going from text to uh, images in an automatic fashion. So there shouldn't be anything about that RGB representation or even the clipart representation. You should be able to learn that just within the text embeddings. Um, and that's what we've done. So I won't talk about the details of that. But we try to learn embeddings or representations of text such that similarity in this new representation space respects similarity that you would have had in the generated image space. Right? And so that, you, that sort of makes your inference much faster now. You don't actually need to generate these scenes. All right, and so one last thing that I want to talk about, and it should only take a couple minutes, um, is pushing this forward, right? So with this common sense, um, reasoning one nice space in which you can test whether a system has common sense or not is um, with humor. And so we wanted to see if we can get a machine to learn about visual humor through these abstract scenes. Um, and so the tasks that we might give a machine are we give the machine a scene, and we ask it to rate on a scale of one through five how, how funny it thinks it is, um, or we might give it a funny, Oh, yeah, I missed the guy. I was like, what's funny about that? <laughs> well, you might still think what's funny about that, but I mean, I know what's supposed to be funny about it. Um, so I can give the machine a funny scene and ask it to modify it as little as necessary so that the scene stops being funny. You might say, why would you ever do that? So you can also go the other way, where you start from a, a boring scene, so to speak, and you get the machine to try and make it more funny. Right? So these are sort of the space of tasks that we looked at. Um, and we did what by now you'll probably guess um, we would do. We asked people to create just regular scenes. We also asked people to create funny scenes. And we can start. Um, and we also gave people, then we took one of those funny scenes, went back to other Turkers, and asked them to identify what part of the scene is what's making it funny, um, and replacing it with something else so that the scene stops being funny while still being realistic and plausible. Right? Um, and then we tried to get the machine to do the same thing. So here's an example of we give it a funny scene, and the machine is now automatically identifying which objects are contributing to humor. So the machine decided that these three objects are contributing to humor. And then we asked it to go ahead and replace them with something that is semantically meaningful but stops making the scene funny. It chooses to replace a bunch of things with butterflies. Because butterflies can do no harm, they're not funny, and you can just kind of place them. So if it's outdoor, it, if it's outdoor, it makes it a butterfly. If it's indoor, it makes it a potted plant. Um, so, um, and then here's one where we are giving it a boring scene. We are asking it to make it funnier, so it decides to add these um, objects in. Um, and we, act, we test it out. So if we go back to people, so this was the original funny scene, and this was what the machine has now. Well, the machine believes it has suppressed the humor. And we ask people which image is less funny. And people do agree that the suppressed image is less funny. So that's good. You can also do like a Turing test, right? So this was the original. So this was the not funny scene. This is what the algorithm did to make it funny. And this was the not funny version of this funny scene that a human had created. 
right? So that entire loop is not important. What's important is this is a not funny scene. This was what a human thought was a funny version of this. This is what a machine made as a funny version of this. And then we ask people which one is funnier. Um, and humans are still beating us, <laughs> so we haven't solved it. But 28% of the time, people think that the scene that the machine created was actually funnier than what a human created. And I thought of that as success. Um, one thing, so this is one of the scenes that our, our system thought is the funniest. I think generally when there's a lot of something, the machine tends to think it's funny. Um, <laughs> One thing we struggled with was mechanical Turk workers would give us these scenes back, and a lot of times it wasn't, like we weren't really laughing ha ha out loud at it. Um, and so we decided to ask them why they thought it was funny, like what were you trying to create, what story were you trying to tell? Um, and so this is one example where the worker explains that this terrified woman's house is being invaded by mice as the cat sleeps, and that's why it's funny. Um, this one, the man is about to trip on his child's car and spill wine on his wife, which the Turger thought was funny. I don't know if I would agree. Um, uh, and so yeah, so, so just to wrap up, um, I talked a lot about sort of this visual abstraction space. Um, we've tried to do some uh, fun things with it, things like studying mappings between vision and language, um, things like zero-shot learning, where you're learning what interactions between people look like without ever using a real example, just from illustration through this interactive interface, um, and studying sort of higher-level concepts like image memorability or specificity, which I didn't talk about, um, but something like visual humor, which would be much harder to get at if you had to rely on low-level noisy object detectors, which are not very accurate right now. Um, and so this is sort of studying high-level image understanding tasks without having to wait for sort of all the low-level processing to catch up. Right? Um, I talked a little bit about how we can use this to learn some common sense knowledge. Um, and I think what's exciting about this is overall that it's a very rich um, annotation modality, right? You can do all sorts of interactions. Like I can have a scene and ask someone to describe it. That you can do with real images also. But now I can do the flip. I can start with the description and ask people to illustrate that to me, right? So whatever it is that I want to learn, if I can convey to a human, they can create a scene that tells me what that looks like within the scope of the virtual world that we have. I can show you a scene, and I can ask you to modify it in a way that some property goes up or down. For example, humor, but it could be other things. Um, and I can perturb a scene and ask you how the meaning changed. Right. So I think um, actively exploring this space, um, sort of really pushing the learning by playing uh, modality that I was talking about earlier, I think would be very exciting. Um, so this data set, it has 50,000 scenes with captions and questions and answers. And so if anyone's interested, you're welcome to try it out. Uh, but with that, I'll stop. Thank you. So, so how how exactly were the images helping um, beyond the text alone? So, you know, so you have these sentences like a man is holding the book or the tree is growing in the table. So then it would try to create an image that goes along with that, and then what? Uh, what, what happens then? Right, so I think I, I glossed over. So for each one of the tasks, the approach is slightly different. But so if you're looking at the uh, case where you're trying to assess how plausible a tuple is, what ends up happening is when you say man uh, or tree grows in table, it, it has access to a database of these abstract scenes. And it tries to take that description and see if it can find support for that description in any of these images in addition to having a database of text that it, that it has access to, where it also looks for support. right? So the baseline approach just has a database of text, and it's trying to see, have I ever read uh, tree grows in table? And it, you probably won't find too much support for it. But in addition to that, it also looks at a database of images and sees, have I and, and reasons about, have I ever seen tree growing in table? So if this text description doesn't match any of the images that it has seen, it will decide that this probably is not very plausible. And the function that assesses whether a piece of text matches um, images or not is learned offline through a corpus of images and associated text. Right? So offline, if you have a database of these abstract scenes and descriptions, you can learn which text matches which visual data. And that's also what we used for generating scenes and all of that. Right? Um, and so through that, you can, you can read. Does that, does that make sense? So, then, um, so the sort of things that would pick up then are there's a bunch of words that do, you know, that do commonly co-occur in a sentence, but it's only when you actually try to assemble them in a scene that you that you will them. fail to do so. Right, right. One nice example uh, might be that if someone that 
Um, it doesn't relate to one of the specific tasks, but just conceptually, um, if you think about eating versus looking at, in text, you wouldn't necessarily think those are similar. So if you look at like word to vec representations, those are not going to be very close. But in images, when someone is about to eat something, they are also looking at it. And so in images, you would realize that actually the process that eating does imply looking at. And so those vectors in the visual word to vec space that I was showing would end up being closer together. And so coming back to that example of man um, eating, or whether it's plausible for man to be looking at a cake, maybe people don't talk about that too much in text. Maybe people talk about man eating cake quite a bit. But if your word to vec representation is now informed by the fact that in order to be eating something, you need to be looking at it, you will now decide that even though I haven't read man looking at cake too often, I have read man eating cake too often, but the latter will give me evidence for the former because it's been informed by the visual so world and not just the text. <laughs> yeah, um, and so there is an issue of symmetry there that uh, look, eating implies looking at, but looking at doesn't imply eating. Um, and yeah, we can, we can talk about that more. There are ways of learning embeddings that respect this order, but we haven't done that so far. Yeah, yes. Uh, it's kind of interesting that these zero shot type learning, especially in this case where you have completely different types of data, that it doesn't overgeneralize. It's, uh, what do you think is the intuitive reason? I mean, it, it's, it's not doing very well, right, at all. Like I said, that you, fif the accuracy that you get by using 50 synthetic examples is similar to what you would have gotten if you had just three, two to three realistic examples. I see. Right? I see. So it's not very good. It's not, so it's, it's much better than chance, but it's not a good proxy for real data. I wouldn't say, so only if you had concepts where you really cannot find real examples, I would suggest that you can learn it through this, uh, this virtual world. But the problem that happens is in order to ever demonstrate this point, we will need those real examples as test images, right? So from just a perspective of running an experiment and writing a paper and sort of convincing someone that this makes sense, we can only look at concepts for which we do actually have real images so that I can use them as test data. No, but the uh, one about uh, holding hands. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess, yeah, so I guess I, 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 so it works much better than chance, but it doesn't work, but uh, yeah, the statement is exactly that. The, the accuracy that you get with 50 examples is what you would get with three realistic examples anyway. So for that application, I would not suggest that you should use this as a way of learning. If you really cared about an application of detecting how people interact, I wouldn't suggest that you should learn it from at least the simple clipart interface that we have, right? Oh, for, yeah, for, right, and then I was trying to make maybe a little too much of a meta point that the scenarios in which it would make sense to use this clipart interface are scenarios where you really don't have real examples to learn from, right? But then coming back to being able to conduct an experiment to compute accuracies of how well you've learned that concept, you will need test images from those concepts, right? You will need real test images. And so you will not be able, to, yeah, maybe we can talk more offline. Um, but as it stands, it doesn't work a whole lot better, but I wouldn't suggest replacing it. I didn't hear what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would agree for this last conversation, so we should probably continue over coffee break, but yeah. <laughs> Great, let's thank Debbie.